Welcome to Restore the Glory podcast. My name is Jake Kim. And I'm Bob Schutz. We're two Catholic therapists sharing what we've learned personally and professionally to help you on the journey of restoration. Bob, good to see you again. Good to be with you. Uh, really quickly, how are you guys doing down in Florida? I noticed that the hurricanes were coming through, but they kind of, they, they went past you, right? Yeah, they hit uh, over on the Louisiana, Texas border. Yeah. I, I really, we have some friends over there, but I haven't heard too much. I know mm. that friends we have in uh, the central parts of Louisiana, south part, said they missed them. Um, oh, wow. And then the people that I know in Houston said it missed them, but I haven't heard the in-between groups. Wow. I know I feel for you guys all the time. It's one of those things, right? You're probably just used to it because you lived there for so long, but... I just, it's from, in Canada, we look down on the news and go, who in their right mind would live in a place where these <laughs> giant storms come running through, right? You guys probably look at us and go, who in their right mind would live where it goes minus 70 or whatever it does in parts of Canada? Yeah. Uh, we all find our little ways, don't we? There we do. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's good. I'm glad I was concerned about, well, all of you, but when I heard that it was coming up right through your guys' neck of the woods, I was, I'm, I'm glad it didn't hit you, but. God bless the people that it did affect. So yeah, I, I have shared about it in different writings. But the the scariest hurricane for me was the week before Margie died when I was coming home from my dad's funeral, and it was coming right at Tallahassee, and it was supposed to be a, a five, and oh. and we didn't want to move Margie, and so it was just this. I was coming home in it from my wow. dad's funeral. Didn't know what to do. My kids didn't know what to do because they were there with Margie and she was in a pretty infirm place. And mm. so uh, that was one of the scariest hurricanes of all of them. And at the last minute, it turned to the right and missed us and wow. uh, and, and slowed down. So uh, it was a That's, godsend. Yeah, yeah no kidding. Just, it's terrifying when when you know this coming full force at you. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. It's like, yeah. wow. Yeah. yeah. I'm talking about our series on fear, that that, that was a, a lot of practice of faith in that situation, <laughs> and really yeah. asking God what He wanted us to do, and, and wow. praying for His intervention. So that's really powerful. Just to you know, like just the practical lived experience of in the midst of a real difficult situation to turn to the Lord and to have the faith to walk in what He says. You know, like that's wow. Because I, I I remember you driving me to the airport after an event and sharing the story with me, I was just, I can, I, I'm still doing it now. My eyes are just wide about, wow, that's faith put into practice, right? Cause you're, you're risking it, you know, yeah. like it's not where it's just easy. You know, do I read this book, God, or read that book? You know, there's no real, doesn't really kind of hurt you either way, you know? Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's, that's powerful. And you really question, am I, are we really hear, hearing you God, God as we're listening for what you're calling us to do? Are we really listening? You know, is this our imagination? Is this our fear? Or Right. Uh, okay. I imagine our listeners are like, well, what happened? <laughs> so, <laughs> so do you want to finish rounding out the story? I mean, we, I made it home. Uh, all of our family made it home. Uh, and the storm turned to the right and uh, slowed down. And so mm. the, it didn't do a tremendous amount of damage anywhere it went. Mm. And Margie was safe. And we ended up being there as a family with her in our home uh, in her last week. And, mm. you know, she died in our presence with no having, not having to worry about all the damage of a hurricane all around us. Wow. You know what I imagine one time, Bob, it'd probably be really beautiful is to, for us to talk through just all that, that experience, you know, like I'm, there's so much there, but I know as I'm hearing you talk, I'm, my heart is intrigued to just hear more of your heart about that story and, you know, what that was like and what you learned, but uh, yeah, we'll just I, acknowledge that maybe that's one day. Yeah. And in the meantime, it's in uh, Real Suffering, the book, Real Suffering through Tan. So I, I read a lot about that. There you go. Yeah. But All right. yeah, I'd be glad to talk about it together. Cool. So we are in our series here on uh, the anatomy of a wound. And uh, this series, we're talking through one of, this is kind of one of the most basic kind of teachings or principles or truths about healing, because, you know, you hear it all the time, healing. Well, what are you healing? A wound. And then everybody's like, well, what does that mean? And what, what's going on? And that's exactly what this series is all about, is breaking down the anatomy of a wound. 
And Bob, in the past, we've talked about kind of the concentric circles. Um, and so just want to review those with us real quick. What are the concentric circles of the anatomy of a wound? And then we'll dive into the specific one for today. Yeah. And it, these are kind of like picturing our hearts and our hearts are made for love. And when we have some offense against love, either the absence of love or the presence of some kind of a wound against love, our hearts get wounded. We, we store that in our bodies, in our hearts, in our souls until it's healed. And so they don't just go away. And they particularly get stored around our beliefs, which is the first circle around that. And, you know, we, we, we have beliefs as a way of understanding ourselves through that woundedness in a way of protecting ourselves against the hurt by other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the level of beliefs. And so last time we talked about identity lies, which is what we believe about ourselves. And today we're going to be talking about judgments, which is the judgments towards other people or life or God, you know, mm -hmm. how, we, how our perceptions get colored by our woundedness mm -hmm. and how those become a barrier to love. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then the outer circle is what we do out of those beliefs and judgments is we make what we call inner vows, they're ungodly vows, they're resolutions, whether conscious or not conscious, of ways of protecting and saving ourselves, ways mm -hmm. of fixing our will in order to deal with that wound. And so a lot of times it's directly out of the judgments that we've formed these vows. We'll talk about that next time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I found that it's simple, but it's not simple. I think when you get used to it, it becomes simple. And man, that's really handy to know the simplicity of the circles because, you know, when you develop the skill of self-awareness, it's, you can pretty quickly zoom right in on what's going on. And it's similar. That's why I like the analogy of anatomy. Cause when you know what's happening, you know how to respond, you know, uh, the response to a vow is different than the response to a lie, you know, uh, you, you handle them a bit differently. And so that's the value of understanding what it is because then you can respond to it more appropriately. Yeah. Um, so, and it, yeah. Yeah, and Jesus is, is the divine physician, really the great heart surgeon, mm -hmm. right? And so we're talking about heart surgery, so you need to understand the anatomy of the heart to know how to do the surgery. What's, what, where's the disease part, and what's the part of the heart that you're trying to restore? Mm. So good. And that, that's healing. That's restoration. You know, that, yes. that's, that's how we restore our hearts. Um, so today, again, we're talking about judgments, and that's kind of the second part of beliefs. So beliefs, there's identity, lies, and judgments. And that's what we're zooming in on today is judgment. So our scripture for today is from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. And this is Jesus, and he says, Stop judging that you may not be judged. For as you judge, so will you be judged. And the measure with which you measure will be measured out to you. So I'll say that one more time for this from Matthew 7, verses 1 to 3. Stop judging that you may not be judged. For as you judge, so will you be judged. And the measure with which you measure will be measured out to you. Bob, I have to say that this is one of those times, if you don't understand it, it seems like he's just talking gibberish, you know, like it, it's really one of those times where you got to pause and acknowledge this is God incarnate teaching us about what happens in the reality of life. This is how the order of things works. And it's not some condemning statement. It's not him kind of shaming us and, and pointing a finger, you stupid creatures. You know, that's not at all what's going on. He's trying to reveal the reality of life. And so when you pause and sit with this, this is a really life-giving scripture, and it can really set a whole lot of things free when we understand it. So what strikes you as you hear it? Yeah, just to follow on what you've just said, it's it's this is like the law of gravity in physics. You know, this is this is the law of spiritual freedom. What prevents our freedom? What prevents us from living a life that's full of love? And this mm -hmm. is one of the main things. And it's tied in with unforgiveness, but it's uh and so the scripture talks a lot about this actually, mm -hmm. uh, because it's an aspect of our unforgiveness uh when mm -hmm. we've been hurt. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually when we are holding on to an offense, we're holding on to a judgment with that offense. Mm -hmm. And so one, one of the things we talk about, and, and we just want to make sure everybody understands, we're not saying that God is going to judge us the yep. way that we judge other people. That God, God has an, a compassionate heart. God mm -hmm. has a merciful heart. We were talking about 
a passage from the Catechism. So I just want to read this because this kind of gives a picture of that. Yes. Uh, this is from Catechism, where it's talking about the Our Father and forgive us our sins as we've forgiven mm -hmm. others. And it says, And now this is daunting. This outpouring of mercy cannot penetrate our hearts as long as we have not forgiven those who have trespassed against us. And so in a corollary way, mm -hmm. uh, we can't receive mercy if we're holding on to judgment. It's like our judgments block our capacity to give and receive mercy. And again, we, we've talked about the difference between a good judgment and a bad judgment. We're not mm -hmm. saying you can't make a judgment about whether something's good or bad. Mm -hmm. You know, again, using the example that I've used before, when my, my father was unfaithful to my mother, in my child's heart, there was a holy judgment that I learned that adultery is bad. It was the breaking of the sixth commandment. Okay. Yep. So to be able to call truth what it is, call sin what it is, is a holy judgment. But in my heart as a child, because of the hurt, I did more than that. I made a judgment about my dad from a place of self-protection and superiority. Okay, so when I make that judgment, I'm no longer looking at him with compassion and judging what he did is wrong, the way that God sees us. I'm standing in the place, really, the place of the accuser, the enemy of our souls, who takes every fault of ours and despises us, looks down on us, has contempt for us. And in that contempt, we end up putting that other person and ourselves in prison. We end up coloring our perception of the other person. We see them through how they wounded us, and they can't be redeemed in that way. They're, they're just stuck into this mold of, oh, my dad's an adulterer, rather than mm. he's my father who loves me, mm. uh, and he's a good man in other respects. But there's this place of brokenness in his life that he's definitely hurt himself and my mother and our family because of mm -hmm. that. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're acknowledging the truth of what happened, but not jumping into that self-righteousness of looking mm -hmm. down and despising, as Jesus said about the Pharisee in the in the temple looking down at the tax collector. That's the yeah. unholy kind of judgment. How about you? What what this, strikes you uh, yeah. on all that? There's all I'm getting striked all over the place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what's hitting me is such a simple statement that's so far reaching and big. You know, I like the analogy like you used of gravity. You know. You can really take it for granted, but if, if you're somebody who works with heavy things above your head, you have a great respect for gravity because you don't <laughs> want to die, right? So it's, you're always aware of that tendency for the thing to fall on you. And so you can take for granted these little judgments, these little things that you say about people and not really appreciate the impact that they have. You know, Bob, I, there are so many examples that I could give from my clinical practice about the power of a judgment. And I have to say the ones that come to mind first and foremost have to do are, are in marriage. Mm -hmm. The power of judgments in marriage to me are so significant. Now, and that doesn't mean it's only in marriage. I can think of the power of judgments in friendships, the power of judgments in colleagues and work relationships, the power of judgment in a parish setting. I mean, just that they're so common. They're everywhere. And I imagine those of us who are wounded, which is all of us, that if we're aware, there's this dynamic in us that kind of goes something like, well, well but, but, but hang on, they hurt me. I mean, you want me to surrender myself again to the abuse that this person gave to me? Is that what you're asking me to do? That's what Christianity is? And we say, no, no, that's not what it is at all, because you're not getting out of your dignity seat and lowering yourself to a doormat, nor are you getting out of your dignity and raising yourself to the accuser or the judge. You're remaining who you are. And woundedness kind of knocks us off of our dignity, knocks us out of our dignity, or at least the beliefs and the lies do. But if we're not careful, and that's what I think people automatically think. Well, then I'm a doormat and then they're going to abuse me to, again. No, not necessarily. You need to remain in dignity. You need to remain in the truth of who you are. I call that, and that's a, a whole other conversation, what, which is self-possession. It's a big thing I'm working a lot with my clients on is this concept of self-possession. Um, we'll talk about that another time, but it's this critical dynamic where I am who I am. 
and I'm not tossed around. And so I can look at a situation and say, that was wrong and that shouldn't be done. But it doesn't go to the place of you are wrong you deserve dot, 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 because now I've shifted positions and I'm now saying, God, can you scoot over? Uh, I'll take care of this one, God. Why don't you, you know, go take a break? I'll handle this moron here. I find that that's an important thing that it, we have to remain in dignity, uh-huh. which means you do have to say what is right and wrong, but it's a whole different thing to raise up to a different seat of accusation. Yes, and that's the accusation is in condemnation is the is the key the thing. problem. And it yeah. doesn't mean go to become a doormat, become, you know, a, a punching bag. That's getting out of the same place of God, our God-given dignity as well. You know, we're not supposed to leave ourselves and become less or become more. Neither one is yeah. the way to go. As you're speaking, I'm thinking of uh, a scene in the, in the book and the movie of The Shack. Have you seen that? Yeah. Where he's asking the main character, uh, to be the judge, to be the right. judge of God. Uh, and he, he just gets himself into this uh, straitjacket, realizing that he doesn't want to be the judge anymore of yeah. God or of other people or of the man who killed his daughter. And God is a just judge, a, a just and merciful judge. Satan and evil is an unjust judge and an accuser who mm. communicates his nature you know, he's living under eternal judgment and he tries to bring all of us under that eternal condemnation. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's really the key thing here. Can we look at things the way God looks at things and people, always seeing their, their dignity mm-hmm. while seeing the places that diminish their dignity and hurt us mm-hmm. and hurt themselves? Or are we standing in a posture of condemnation towards somebody where we're Putting themselves and putting them and ourselves in prison. I mean, that's literally what it is. It's a prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when we realize that, then all of us want to get out of prison. We may not yep. want the person who hurt us to get out of prison, but we certainly want to get out of prison. Sure. And we're not getting out of prison until we let them out. Right. Yeah. There, you know, one of the things that I, I'm curious what you, I don't think we've ever talked about this before. So I'm curious what your experience is with this because in my work with people, I can't think of a hundred percent, I can't remember a hundred percent of the times, but I have enough memories to go. I recall the sequence of events going something like the identity lies, which is the first part of beliefs were addressed first. And then the judgments were addressed later. Now I'm sure it could be done the other way, but here's what I noticed when I was watching that dynamic was if you believe that you're unsafe, that you're bad, that you're whatever, it is very hard to then step into forgiveness. You can't go there because it just confirms that first identity lie. And so I found if people are like, but I can't forgive, I can't, I can't go there. I'm not going to go there. It can often be the case that there's a lie that's blocking doing the forgiveness work. Like if I forgive them, I'll be hurt again. Well, that's a really, that's a really common sense way to understand why you're struggling with this judgment and you can't work through the judgment. Have you found that same thing? Yeah, very much. Uh, It can work in the opposite, but yes. And that's why I think the way we're talking about the anatomy of the wound, there's the wound and there's the belief about ourselves. And healing those two first frees us up then to deal with the judgments and heal those. Right. Which then helps us heal the vows, even though we may deal with the vows in a different way. I think that's important for people to know is that if you're trying to forgive and you're just all kind of blocked and you just can't go there, it's worth checking out what you believe about yourself, what you believe will happen to yourself if you forgive, what you think will happen if I don't judge what's going to happen. Because I think sometimes people judge as like putting their, they're trying to create space right between themselves and somebody else because they don't want to get hurt again. I think that's the majority of reasons why we judge. Right. You know, if you look at our whole political situation, situation in the nation now, how Mm -hmm. rampant the judgments are going back and forth, back and forth. And and rather than protect us, they create an increased sense of not being safe. So the very thing that we're trying to do, they do the opposite. Right. And and that's where I think maybe we we re-encounter Jesus's uh, wisdom by stop judging that you may not be judged. Here's an example for me that that's one that I, I really have struggled with and I'm trying to think of how to introduce it, but I'll introduce it this way. When I was growing up, 
doing chores and, and stuff was an important part of life. And it, it was great. It taught me a lot about work ethic and not just sitting around all day. And so that was an excellent part of it. And yet at the same time, I kind of got the message that if you're lazy, that's bad. Don't be lazy. And there's a truth to that. Now, here's where it starts to backfire is that as a dad, I am so quick to look at my kids and just go, would you stop being lazy? And that is a judgment. And here's how it backfires. That same judgment that I give to them indicts me. And now I'm automatically and instantly judged. And so I sit there and go, well, stop being so lazy then, buddy, looking in the mirror, right? Mm -hmm. And then I all of a sudden find this momentum to my life and I'm like a train going downhill. And it's all because of this judgment I've made that's now back biting me as well. Yeah. And so I'm like, nobody can be lazy. And then it creates this kind of chaos in the house, you know? Yeah, that's a great example. And it seems so simple and it seems so common. And there may be a descriptor of a behavior, a behavior, you know, somebody who's being lazy or being slothful or something like that, but it so easily turns into a condemnation of the person's character. And then you begin to see the person through that filter. Right. So everything a person does, you begin to see them through the filter of, well, they're just lazy uh, oh, without yeah. any understanding or compassion for what the experience is like on their end. And, you know, sometimes growing up in an environment where work is really valued, right. uh, then work can become almost like a god. Yeah. Right. And so anybody that doesn't live up to that and the person who's under that kind of oppression can feel the oppression of it, that there's there's something in this that feels like my values tied into my work rather yeah. than my values tied into being seen for who I am. And, and so then that can create its own dynamic there. But that yeah. judgment just keeps reinforcing itself and reinforcing itself. And so then the person on the receiving end of that now it develops an identity lie. I'm yeah. lazy, right? Yeah. And so then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, I'm just, I guess I'm just lazy. Oh, so true. Bob, that was just the point I was just thinking is that identity lies seem to be at the core of the matter here. Yes. And what's interesting is what a judgment is, is you passing on an identity lie. Yes. To projecting it else. out. Projecting, projecting it out. Yeah. And what, what's more core than who we are? than our identity. And so the nuance of the beliefs is really important because yeah, at some point it's like a funnel. They all funnel back to an identity lie. But when you're the one doing the condemning, it's, it's kind of like a double hit because when you're doing the judging, you're also judging yourself and you're reinforcing identity lies that you've got going on within you. Yes. You know, I hope our listeners can see and maybe appreciate the intricacy of what we're saying, because essentially it's like you're just shooting identity lie bullets all over the place and they, they backfire and they hit you too. And so bestowing identity lies, I mean, that's one of the things as a parent, that's one of the worst feelings in the world as a parent is to have the awareness maybe after the fact that you operated out of some measure of woundedness yourself and you look and you go, I think I just passed on an identity lie. Maybe you don't use those words in the moment, but you just go, oh my gosh, they walked away with this belief. Here's one of the saddest, oh, this just breaks my heart when I think about it because I've I've had to do a lot of repair with this with my son, Judah. Um, When he was younger and I was much more impatient and he had more need, and those are just truths. I'm impatient, more impatient. He had more need. He's more independent now. He's 14. So, but when he was younger, I would say things to him and I would start the phrase with, son, would you dot, 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 or son, why are you, son, what, what's happened? What's wrong with you? Those kinds of things. And he would hear this son, son. And then I used, I remember putting him in bed one time and I just said, son, I love you. And he goes, daddy, can you not use the word son? Wow. Yeah. And I just went, oh. And I paused and I said, Judah, help me understand why. And he said, well, that's, that's bad. That means I'm bad. Wow. Yeah. And all it took was me repeating that it was the phrasing of me saying that to him. And he interpreted that son, which is an identity statement. Yeah. And he received it as 
that's bad because I always used it with this tone. I always used it with this dynamic of me trying to manage myself. And yeah. Bob, there's been a lot of nights that I've wept over that reality in Judah's life. And I've had to do a lot of repenting to the Lord as well as to him and to ask for his forgiveness, you yeah. know? And so what do you hear as you hear that example? Yeah, that's a good, good example because the judgment there doesn't sound like a judgment. The, hmm. the judgment's communicated in the tone of voice, in right. facial expression, in body postures, in impatience. Right. It, it's, not a, it's not an obvious judgment. But your son feels judged by the word son. Yes. He feels like it colors him as a bad person. Right. And so he's going to come along and hear you're God's beloved son, and it's going to create all kind of confusion in his heart, just like that moment created, son, I love you. Um, yeah. Because the belief, the internal belief is son is bad. You know, right. Son is uh, somehow an object of scorn rather than an object of love. And now that obviously isn't your whole approach to him, but in that no. aspect yeah. of a relationship with him, that's it. You know, bring it back to my relationship with my dad. Uh, right. It wasn't my whole relationship with my dad, but as long as I was judging him in those early years of my teenage years and into early adulthood as an adulterer, then I developed this perception of him that didn't allow him to be fully himself. And right. then I lived, you know, the measure you use is measured back to you. I lived in this fear of being like him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and therefore suppressing my sexuality. I wouldn't allow myself to get close to women. Mm -hmm. out of fear mm -hmm. that I would be like my dad. You know, that's the vow part of it. But the judgment, yeah. the judgment was it kept me in prison until I realized it and released it. And then when I released it, I could also see and understand my dad. And one of the most beautiful experiences with my dad was being able to pray with him uh, mm -hmm. for four hours. And we mm -hmm. went through his whole life and we just prayed for the places of his woundedness and his identity lies and his wow. sins. And when we did that, I got to see in the inside of his heart mm. and how similar our hearts were. Mm. We just made different choices. And it just changed my understanding. And, and I really, again, in the same way, felt so bad for the way that I judged him. You know, what he did hurt. And we talked about that, too. And we, we worked through that. But, but just to be able to see him as a person and to truly forgive him and have compassion for him, that, that's the opposite, is, is that compassion you have for somebody else. Yeah. I, re I recall navigating these dynamics through with Judah and it just reminded me as you were talking there, it reminded me of when I was, when I would try to, when I would see what I had done and I, and I kind of started peeling back the layers of the anatomy of that experience. Cause that was wounding for him, but he, he's little, so he doesn't know how to navigate it. So that's, yeah. that's part of my job. So I'm peeling that back for him. And I'm realizing that in those moments that I'm saying, son, why blah, 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 whatever. What's actually happening is I'm being indicted by the very same judgment that I'm judging him by, and I'm operating out of that judgment. In other words, let's say that um, we're cleaning up the garage or something and, and something falls over. Well, I'm hearing what's wrong with you. Uh -huh. Why did you mess up? And I'm also bestowing that judgment as well. And so that's exactly Jesus's phrase, judge not, yes, do you be judged? We're both under the wrongful authority of that lie of I'm bad. Uh, that's not good. And so I've had to see that that's the case and actually ask my son for forgiveness. To me, this has been one of the most healing parts of it is that, yeah. yes, I'm his father and I'll always stay in that spot of dignity as his father. But I can also acknowledge the truth that that wasn't right. And I can approach him and say, will you forgive me? I've done something wrong. And it's a beautiful thing I found with parenting to, when, when you've done something wrong, own it and own it quickly. And here's something else that he would do. And I just share this with our listeners is that he would say, as he got older, he would say, oh, that's okay. And I would say, Judah, it's not okay. Mm -hmm. What I did was not okay because you don't deserve to be treated that way. And that's not who you are. That was wrong of me. I, I didn't treat you as you were. It's not okay. Will you forgive me? Because it wasn't okay. And it's interesting it, when, he, when he hears that, he's hearing the acknowledgement. It's in a way undoing, it's untwisting yeah. the lie. 
Yeah. Right? It did matter. You do matter. And yeah. I was in the wrong. Please yeah. forgive me. And I hurt you by my judgment or my attitude towards you. Yeah, yeah. that's so powerful. I, again, uh, I, I often talk about the ways my dad wounded me, but one of the one of the most powerful things with my dad as a child was just what you described. Mm. He would discipline me and he, he at times would, would get harsh in the discipline mm -hmm. and I would get my feelings hurt and he would inevitably come to where I was, sit down with me and apologize for his part and explain the reason for mm. the correction. The offense was gone. There was no judgment there, mm. you know, after that, uh, mm -hmm. because it was, it was free. But those right. areas that, you know, when he left after the adultery and we didn't have chance to, for years to, to talk about it, right. still that was talked about, the judgment stayed in my heart. Yeah. But it wasn't, in this case, him talking about it that released a judgment. It was me as an adult having to come to an awareness hmm. of how it hurt me first hmm. and how I held on to a judgment. And hmm. then I dealt with the judgment. And then I went to him and apologized to him hmm. for the judgment that I held towards him. And then That's so good. the healing came the other way. I love the phrase that you used a moment ago. And I, and I, I know, again, I know it. That's our, I always use our tagline personally and professionally, but I do. I know it in those two categories that you said, and then you look at the person through that lens yeah. of the judgment. And that's kind of that, that snowball effect or the, you're, you're slipping and you just keep slipping worse and worse and worse. You know, when you make that initial judgment, it taints the view that you have of the other person. That's why you have to be so careful because our hearts are sensitive. Yes. And when you taint the view of someone else and then you continue to see them that way, it affects your view of who they actually are. God have mercy on me. I, there have been so many people that I've judged and then it's significantly affected the relationship. And then I see them through that lens and I feel justified in what I'm right. doing. Oh, I'm right. I'm right. sure I'm right. They're blank and blank and blank. Instead of letting God figure out all that and me staying in my spot of dignity, staying in the dignity of the truth of who I am, but boy, does that stuff ever change how you see somebody. And, and if you're not careful, you can write somebody off. Yep. You can write a spouse off. You can write a kid off. You can write your pastor off. You can write your best friend off. You know, they're powerful things yep. when you look through them. Or a political party or a president or <laughs> a <laughs> yeah. candidate or, you know, right. I mean, how much this is playing out. Your phrase that I, I just want to emphasize is the dignity of your person, you know, the dignity of your own person. And if you lose sight of that dignity, then inevitably, as we said, we're going to project it out. You know, the measures that you use are going to be measured back. If you lose the dignity of the person across from you, you're going to start losing your own dignity. They're interchangeable in a sense. Mm -hmm. Our hearts are made to love. And when we go in the direction of not loving, which is what a wrong judgment is, then it wounds both of us. It mm -hmm. wounds both persons. Yeah. And until that is replaced with love, till it's replaced with compassion, with right judgment, uh, we're still stuck in a place. And, you know, I deal with this every day in my life. Uh, mm. I, I become aware every day of where I'm coloring my perception of God, coloring my perception of somebody else. Uh, you know, it's constant in marriage. It's constant in relationships at work. Right. Uh, right. And, and it's just a constant awareness in the Holy Spirit of where have I stepped out of love and why am I protecting myself? What, what am I protecting in that place? Cause, cause mm -hmm. almost always there's a wound behind it. That is so true. Oh, this is, yeah, there's, it's so good. Bob, we had one more catechism quote, and I think it's just worth sharing with our listeners because it speaks right to forgiveness. And again, you know, we share these quotes with you listeners and things, and, and we want to acknowledge that, you know, this might just be like, whoa, this is a lot. It's over our head. And so you might need to listen to the episode a couple times, right? If something's striking you, you know, that's how I, if something really moves me, I might have to go and sit with it for a bit. I can't just listen to it once and I'm, oh, I'm all good. Good. Got judgments. Awesome. On, on I go. It, it takes a bit more work than that. So if this is moving you and you're going, gosh, there's a lot here, then slow down and be careful not to turn into the condemnation of yourself. And as you navigate this stuff, it, it, it's delicate stuff. Heart surgery is delicate work, right? Mm -hmm. Like, don't just start being flippant. So this uh, is from the Catechism, paragraph 
2843, 2843. It says, thus the Lord's words on forgiveness, the love that loves to the end, become a living reality. The parable of the merciless servant, which crowns the Lord's teaching on ecclesial communion, ends with these words. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. It is there, in fact, in the depths of the heart that everything is bound and loosed. It is not in our power not to feel or to forget an offense, but the heart that offers itself to the Holy Spirit turns injury into compassion and purifies the memory and transforming the hurt into intercession. Like, wow, wow. Bob. Yeah. That's just Holy Spirit infused language there. I mean, we could spend a whole episode talking about that, but just quickly, any, any kind of things that jump right out on this, we'll let our listeners listen pray yeah. through it more on their own. Yeah, I think the first one, and it's a place that I get tripped up initially, is uh, at the beginning part of that quote, which is, and the Father will do to you, mm. right? Uh, mm. and, and it makes it sound like the Father is punitive in a retaliatory sense. Yeah. Uh, and just that that language makes it sound like every mistake you make, God's going to come in and just beat you to a pulp. Yeah, yeah. and and that's not the heart of the Father. You know, yeah. it it becomes part of the judgment towards the Father. What it's saying there is this divine justice that whatever measure we use for others is measured back. You know, it's mm. it's going back to that scripture, mm. uh, but it's. When we practice mercy, we receive the mercy that's already been given. God's mercy mm -hmm. has already been given to us. Mm -hmm. It's been poured out at the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the heart of the Father. It's in creation. It's in every part of his being, his mercy. But there's also justice. And justice is the measure that we use, we call back on ourselves. And so we need to not only receive his mercy, but extend his mercy. That's what that parable is all about the mm -hmm. parable of the unforgiving servant. Mm -hmm. And it's in our heart that we loose or bind things. That's that's yeah. the thing that jumps out. How about yeah. for you? Yeah, it was just what you said there, that the power of the heart to bind and loose. I mean, it, those of us who are aware that that scripture, it echoes the scriptures about the keys to the kingdom. And when you think about the keys to the kingdom, those are powerful keys, right? It, there's an echo of the language there. And the church is saying to us, it is, in fact, in the depths of the heart that everything is bound and loosed. The power of the heart's beliefs to bind and to loosen, right? That's just monumental. And then the, the language of the church saying, it's not in our power not to feel or to forget an offense. In other words, don't even try to not act like you don't feel it or that you're just going to forgive and forget. That's just silliness. It's not within your power. It is not in our power not to feel or to forget it. We'll remember it. But what can happen is that when we give our hearts to the Holy Spirit, injury can be transformed into compassion. It purifies the memory, and it transforms the hurt into intercession. It's not about forgetting. It's about transformation. Yes. Forgetting has no hope. Transformation has a ton of hope and is so powerful and supernatural. Again, that's from paragraph 2843. And so, Bob, any last kind of thoughts before we wrap up today? Yeah, let's try to make this practical for a second. I, I want to invite everybody to think about the judgments that they hold towards God and where are they based in their life? What, what hurts did they come out of? And then secondly, just kind of make us... Uh, in the present moment, whichever political party that you're affiliated with, I want you to think about the true judgments about right and wrong that are involved in that judgment, but then how you move from right and wrong into judging the people, the party, the politics, you know, everything else. Uh, and so just kind of in that self-awareness, uh, what's right and wrong? In the, in the political party that you disagree with, and maybe in both both political parties, but in the one that you probably would vote in the opposite. Mm -hmm. But then how have you moved from that 
into judging the people? Hmm. And how is that keeping you from love in a very tangible way? In what way is that hampering or binding your heart up by that judgment? Hmm. That's so good. To echo just a final practical for people, um, I would invite people to think about one very important person in your life that's close to you, a spouse, a child, a neighbor, like your friend, your, your dad, your, I don't know, whatever, whatever close person in your life. And just to ask yourself, where have I moved from good judgment to bad judgment? And how has that changed the way that I see them on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. You know, like they're mean, Okay, maybe they did that mean thing there, but if you're sitting there saying to yourself over and over and you've condemned them to be mean, how has that changed the way that you have, you see them and how has that impacted your relationship? And here would be kind of the final, turn to the Lord in repentance for where you have judged. Repent and turn away from that when you've done it. And I would say, if that person is safe, that's a very important caveat. If the person is relatively safe and you have a decent relationship with the person, I would invite you to pray about, don't just go do this. I invite you to pray about going to that person and asking for their forgiveness and saying, I need to come before you in, in humility and say, please forgive me because I've judged you and I've judged you wrongly. And I need to ask for your mercy there. Any yeah, other thoughts? I, I'm thinking about a, a prayer if I can lead everybody through a prayer here, and just Please. just in related to what you just said, uh, you become aware of that judgment, mm -hmm. and you recognize that it's not in love, it's in condescension. And so with that in mind, here's a way of repenting in a very practical way. Father, I acknowledge that I have judged this person, and this is my judgment. And then just be real about the judgment. This is what I believe about that person. Just be real. And then, Father, I don't want this judgment to block my love for you or for them or to block your love for me. And so I renounce that judgment right now. I renounce specifically the belief that this person is, and whatever those beliefs are, person is mean, person is lazy, whatever those things are. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to bring me into a new freedom and a new compassion for this person who I've judged. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. There's so much more we could keep saying, but thanks for listening. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode. And um, we do a lot on social media. And our, our goal with the social media is to help you stay connected to the episode um, in the two weeks between them. So... Every day you'll see a quote or a little audio clip of uh, the episode that's just been released. And our goal with that is to help you stay connected. You know, you don't always have 30, 40 minutes to listen to an episode, but maybe you have, you know, a minute to listen to a clip that can just keep you thinking about it and keep you connected to it. So you can check all that out on social media. That's why we do it. That's why we put it up there. So that's on uh, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Um, also, if you like this episode and maybe you want to share it with a friend, uh, maybe it would bless them. So I encourage you to do that as well. So you can go and um, send them to uh, places that you find podcasts like iTunes, or you can send them to our website, which is RestoreTheGloryPodcast.com. God bless you. And we pray that you would experience the abundance of God's love, mercy, and healing.